Okay, good morning. Excuse the setup there, but you realize on the last recording, I recorded my voice, but not the paper here. And I get some screenshots in there where mostly it was just some ghostly image, not even my happy fractal image. So I was doing a test run just before we started here to make sure that I'm recording the paper. I am fairly confident I am recording the paper right now. So we're going to get started, and we have one mission this morning, and I'm going to clear out some other stuff so I can open some screens for you. Let's get that open. I'll give you a sample of where we are. We're in our last week of instruction. Not our last week of the course, but the last week where we'll present new material. And then we'll follow our standard practice of review and exam in the next week. I just want to show you how that's going to work. And everybody's happy. And everybody seems to be recording. OK, let's show you. Take a brief pit stop at our website here. We're in week 15, we just have a couple things left to discuss. So this week we're looking at the extensions of Green's theorem to space, to three-dimensional space. Remember Green's theorem had two forms, two sides of the coin. It was the flow form and the flux form. And when we extend the flow form to space, we're gonna learn Stokes theorem and when we extend the flux form space, we're gonna learn the divergence theorem. The book calls it the divergence theorem. I'm more comfortable, many people are more comfortable calling it Gauss's theorem in honor of the mathematician, German mathematician, Carl Friedrich von Gauss. Certainly one of the top dogs in mathematics list, you know. You name your top baseball players and everybody's gonna say Babe Ruth or Willie Mays, Mickey Mantle. Oh, you could name some of the current ones too. If you asked somebody, a mathematician, to name his top three mathematicians of all time, well, certainly Gauss would be on that list. Maybe one, two, or three, hard to say. Newton, Gauss, Euler, many current mathematicians too. But we would rather honor Gauss with calling the divergence theorem Gauss's theorem, but that's not here or there. Next week, we're gonna review and exam three. And I want you to look at the assessments, the assignments that are due for the remaining part of the semester. I put them in email. Notice the exam will be Saturday to Saturday. So it'll be released this Saturday by 11.59 PM. This Saturday is December 11, and you'll have seven days to work on it. You will be currently working on a homework. So you got your Thursday, December 9, homework. I'll turn that around very quickly. I'm preparing to turn things around quickly here at the end of the semester. And then you have homework due on Tuesday, December 14, two problems. I'll also turn that around quickly. But you might consider uh, working ahead to the extent you can on the December 14 homework. So you hand in the homework from 6-7 on December 9. If you handed in the homework from 6-8 shortly thereafter, or at least plan to have most of it done, then you'd have your full attention that you can spend on the exam. We're gonna look at these two handouts today, Gauss's theorem and Stokes theorem. And they are very much like the two handouts for Green's theorem curl form and Green's theorem divergence form. So I'm just going to bring up local images of these so that I don't have to depend on the browser, Gauss's theorem and Stokes theorem. We're going to focus on Stokes theorem today, not Gauss's theorem, but the two go hand in hand. 
So let me share, let me get up my Stoke Stam handout and then I'll share that with you at the appropriate time. Other than that, it's just business as usual. So we get started in just a second. And I'm gonna go back to my paper. And these theorems had quite revolutionary consequences, particularly in the theory of electromagnetism. <coughs> that was one of the things they were seriously trying to understand. Electricity and magnetism, they kind of understood that they were related. You know, this produced this, this produced that, but they didn't understand exactly how they were related. People chipped away at these famous theorems. I'll go back to my browser because I want to show you something I want you to read before next week comes along. And you've heard of the famous theorems, let's go to week 16, called Maxwell's equations. You may have read about them or studied them in a physics class. Maxwell's equations are the equations that unite the theories of electricity and magnetism. And they're not called Maxwell's equations because he came up with any of them. Gauss's law of electricity, Gauss's law of magnetism, Faraday's law of induction, Ampere's law. It was Maxwell who added a tiny piece to Ampere's law and realized that the four equations together describe the same phenomenon, electromagnetic radiation. So this part that begins mu naught epsilon naught ddt of the double integral of e dot ds. Now I wrote these four formulas in a physics fashion, but really they come straight from Gauss's law and Stokes theorem, Gauss's theorem and Stokes theorem that we're going to discuss. So kind of very odd consequences of this, particularly the mu naught and the epsilon naught, which we will discuss with you next time or next week. Okay, so I'm gonna put that away. So we're gonna take the flex form or the circulation form. of Green's theorem and extend it to what people call Stokes theorem. And then on Thursday, we're going to take, sorry, since flux and flow begin the same way, they kind of have the same alliteration, easy to mix them. The flow or circulation form becomes Stokes theorem, <coughs> the flux form. becomes Gauss's theorem. So I only want to make this note over here for everybody who views this later. So consider preparing the section 6.8 homework after we discuss it next time. As early as possible. So you can concentrate. on your third exam. Okay, before we present Stokes theorem, and we're just gonna do some examples with it today, that's the most useful thing I can do. I want to show you an uh, odd consequence of Green's theorem. 
this circulation form, because this will warm you up for what we're going to do in Stokes theorem. And it relates to the project that was in your book about a planimeter. Particular device used in surveying that can calculate area using the perimeter of an area. So let's look at it this way. Let me take you through a small progression. If I asked you, and let's just make an agreement in the drawings that I'm about to present so that I don't go over happy labeling things. But if I asked you to find the area of this triangle, and let's agree that every box on my paper represents one unit. So that's all the labeling I'm gonna do right here. Let's say I ask you to find the area of this triangle. You say no sweat. Area equals one half base times height. And this is a right triangle. And one half of the base, we could call two units the base. We could call four units the height. And so you say the area of that is four square units. I also won't write down square units. I'll just talk about the parameter directly. Well, how could we make that more difficult? More interesting. Let's say that I made this triangle the base. What's the area of this triangle? So I can draw a straight line. Again, every box will represent one unit in both the X and Y direction. Well, this is not a right triangle anymore. So I don't have the same visual benefit of this one, but the concept is still the same. Area is one half base times height. You just are not going to measure the height along one of these lines. You're just gonna measure the height as you see it in boxes on the paper, one, two, three, four, five. So if I do one half, base three, and height five, I get 15 over two. You have to excuse me, you see my camera shaking slightly. It's because I've got it mounted on a different uh, stand and that stand seems to be shaking with the desk a little bit. Let me see if I can tighten that up a bit. I don't know if that makes it better. If it becomes really distracting, I'll go back to my former stand. Try to rotate this a little bit. But I did get, ah, I apologize. See, there's the problem right there. Easy to knock this thing. But I did get a little bit closer to the paper. So I have to raise this. So I'm trying to make some improvements as we go along here. Okay, that'll be good for right now. If this gets too shaky, we'll go somewhere else. We'll use a different stand. Now what if I asked you the area of this triangle? Let's put a dot there and a dot there and a dot out here. The same x, y axis, same one unit per box. This handed off to your typical algebra geometry student. This is going to bother them a little bit more because the base times height is not easily readable. You know, I could take any one of these sides to be the base. So I could take this bottom thing to be the base, which is the square root of 10 units, got three units, one unit, this square root of 10 units. 
But then to measure my height, I'm going to have to do some extra calculations, right? So area equals one half base times height. It's not so convenient anymore. Now, you know the plan to get around that with your calculus three knowledge, excuse me, you put up a vector and a vector. If you know the names of the points, you put up this vector. And this vector is called what? Three comma one. zero in the z direction. This vector is called over four and up one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. This vector is called over four and up five. And you can use one half of the cross product of the magnitude, three, one, zero, or five zero. So let's just execute that cross product three one zero four five zero just to show you what the calculation is. So then when I show you a calculation by another means, you won't be so surprised. But we take the cross product of here zero zero, and then this cross product is three times five fifteen minus four. So this cross product is zero, zero, 11. So that's an 11 unit vector coming out of the board. And we understand that the magnitude of half that is the area of that triangle. So we say square root of 11 squared equals 11 over two, and that's five and a half. So is this truly five and a half units? We could try to count the boxes, couldn't we? We could try to get creative and say, let's enclose this triangle in a giant box. And this giant box is four units by five units. So that giant box is 20. And then we're gonna take away a full half of it right here. And this is, Back to the original triangle, one half base times height, one half four times five. That's one half of 20, which is 10. And then we're gonna take away some more pieces, a little square of one and two little triangles. This triangle is three by one. So one half of three by one is three halves. This triangle is four by one. So one half of four by one is subtract two. Now let's see if we can count all these subtractions. 20 minus 10 is 10, minus one is nine, minus two is seven, minus a one and a half is five and a half. So even someone without Calc 3 knowledge could find the area of this triangle in a creative way using traditional or simple triangles. But I want to show you another way to find the area of that triangle. I'm gonna reproduce the triangle over here again. And we were using this point here. Remember all boxes are worth one unit long. And then I went over three and up one. And then I went over one and up four. And let me name these points. Two comma one, five comma two, and six comma six. And now let me do a curious thing with these points. I will walk around the perimeter of this triangle. I will go from two, one to five, two. Then I will go from five, two to six, six. Then I will go from six, six back to two, one. 
And I will do this kind of cute calculation. Let's try it out. Two, one, five, two, six, six, and back to two, one. So then I'm gonna walk all the way around the triangle. Start, first step, second step, third step, back to where I began. And now let me do something that kind of tries to automate this cross product. Let's multiply it down, four, down 30, down six. Then let's multiply up five, up 12, up 12. And let's take the sum of these red numbers, which is 40, minus the sum of the blue numbers, which is 29. And let's do 40 minus 29 divided by two. What do you get? 11 divided by two is also five and a half. So this curious method of walking around the triangle didn't refer to vectors, didn't refer to bounding boxes. Now, now the truth is I am referring to vectors in this kind of determinant like motion I'm taking. But now I pose the question, could we simply find the area by walking around the perimeter? And then I remember Green's theorem, which goes like this, the counterclockwise circulation of a field about a curve C is equal to the curl partial Q partial x minus partial p partial y over the region enclosed with respect to area. So what if partial q partial x minus partial p partial y was one? Then this right-hand side would be the area of A and I will write this out in larger detail in a second. If the curl of F is one, this is curl in the two dimensional space, so it's a scalar. And then this circulation integral will equal the area of A. So it's theoretically possible from Green's theorem that adding up the contribution of the proper field to the curve that bounds this region could do what? Give you the area of this region. Now, what I'm saying is this little cross product, this little determinant action I'm doing right here, let's see the camera is bouncing a bit, is executing the proper field. And so this examination of what is the proper field to do this area calculation, this is in the exercises of the section that did Green's theorem. And it is the basis of what people call a planimeter. As you walk, it's a little rolling wheel and you just like you're measuring distance with a rolling wheel. You've seen people do that. If you use that tool with an extra attachment, as you walk around any region in the plane, you can find the area of that region just by reading the output on the tool. And let me show you that that's not too crazy. So now let's do this. Let's go back to my picture. Let's do my standard one-to-one -one units. But this time, let's draw a little more involved region. Let's go from here to here, to here, to here, to here, to here. Let's look at this region in the plane. So what I'm doing is kind of a useful thing, it's kind of a fun thing, it's a little bit extra right now. I just want to reawake a value and an awe in your mind for Green's theorem. So what's the name of this point right here? Two comma four. And then we can go all the way around, which we will. But notice that I can do that same kind of determinant cross product process here with many points. So what's the name of this next point right here? Three comma one. What's the name of this next point? 
4 comma 3. What's the name of this next point? I got to count carefully. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 comma 2. What's the name of this next point? 8 and 4. I'll give you some reference. Name of this next point. Now I'm going to go backwards. 5 but 6. And then I get back to my starting place, which was 2 and 4. So let me label all these points since I went about doing it anyway. 4 comma 1. And sorry, this is 4 comma 3. And 3 comma 1. So check all the points. 2, 4, 3, 1, 4, 3, 6, 2, 8, 4, 5, 6, 2, 4. Let's do that little downer upper trick. Let's do that little determinant trick. So we multiply 2, 9, 8. 24, 48, and finally 20. And now let's multiply up. And I don't have a lot of room to display things, so I'm just going to say 12, 20, 16, 18, 4. And 12. And now let's do the black minus the green. Now, to do black minus green, maybe I can get some canceling out going on, right? So I notice that 24 is the same as 4 plus 20. Uh, I notice that 8 plus 20 is the same as 12 plus 16. So that cancels out 28, 28. So what else do I got going on? Do I got any other happy canceling going on? I don't know, but I'm satisfied with what I've done. So I have 11 and 48 left here, which is 59. And in green, I have 18 and 12 left, which is 30. When I subtract the two, absolute value divided by two. Absolute value is going to be necessary depending on how I walk around this. If I walk around this in a counterclockwise direction, this number should be positive, but I could walk around it in the other direction as well. So what we're talking about here is 29 over two, that's 14.5 units. Now, are there really 14.5 squares in here? I want you to go and do the rectangle copying and see if you agree. Or you could cut this into triangles and see if you agree. Now this triangle is three by two. This triangle is three by two. Half three by two is three. Half three by two is three. So already I've got six units right there. And then we got this triangle, which is half two by two, so there's two units. And then, let's see, what other, we've got triangles, right? Ooh, we don't have, some, don't have some, some convenient triangles going on right here. What am I gonna have to do to make, I wanted to make happy triangles right here. I thought I could make a happy triangle right here. One half two by one is one. And then I can take square units out of these things here. Let's do this. Here's another half two by one, which is one. And then I have a block, which is three by one right here. And then I have a three by one, half three by one is uh, three over two. Let's add these all up. So this is 10, and this is four and a half. Three plus one and a half is 14.5. Now, the thing is, if I give you a polygonal region now, decomposing like this, well, okay, it's accessible. It can be done, but it takes a little kind of creative puzzle piecing. But if you do this up-down trick, think about this. You could do this on any 
polygonal region. No matter how crazy I bounce around this region. Now you say, well, when do I ever want to find the area of a polygonal region? Well, let's talk about this. Let's talk about a oil spill, or let's talk about a pool in someone's backyard. And for the sake of convenience, again, I'm gonna go one and one units here, but how could I make a decent approximation of the area of this region R? Well, you now you know what I'm about to do. I will put dots around the outside of the region R at reasonable places. It doesn't have to be even a lot of dots. It could just be dots as I walk around the region at fair places. And you know that I won't get the exact area of this region. But if I play that little polygonal game, I will get what? A fair estimate of the area of this region. Sometimes I cut piece off. Sometimes I add piece on. So I don't know exactly what the area of this region is. Maybe I have some other tricks I can use. But how about for a quick and dirty estimate of the area of R, this polygonal game, this game from Green's theorem is not a bad idea. And this is how a planimeter works. So if you have a chance, you could read through that project at the end of this chapter, if you, know, if you have some spare time otherwise. And if you have a friend, family, aunt, uncle, cousin, niece, nephew, father, mother, who has any connection to surveying or architecture, you could ask them if they have a planimeter. I'm not even super confident I'm pronouncing that correctly. I've seen these, but I've never used one. Okay, so this is a cool consequence. of Green's theorem. Okay, let's go for another cool consequence. Let's extend. And we'll have a discussion, then we'll do some examples. Let's extend Green's theorem to space. Okay, this is called Stokes theorem. And I will write it symbolically. And then I'm going to go to the handout where we discuss this in greater theorem. Stokes theorem says the counterclockwise circulation of a field about a curve in space. This curve is a curve in space now. Green's theorem, this curve was a curve in the plane like the border of this pool. I'll get prepared to slide my paper up. Is equal to the flux of the curl of the field. And so flux is dot NDS over the surface S bordered by C. So this says, do a brief sketch and then we'll go to my detailed sketch on the handout, that if I have a surface in space, and let's just describe that surface as a bubble like I ordinarily do. 
And then around the boundary or the edge of that surface. So the edge of that bubble, is a curve C. And if I traverse this in the counterclockwise direction with respect to the normal from S, so let's say S is a normal from S. Now, remember, surface can have a normal in or a normal out. So let's pick the orientation of the normal this way. And then we put our thumb in the direction of the normal and we curl our fingers and we follow this lip in that direction. And this is the front of that edge of the surface. And this is the back. So the circulation around the edge of that bubble is equal to the flux dot NDS of the curl del cross F of the field over the whole surface. Again, like Green's theorem, this can be used in two ways. If you want to calculate a circulation integral that's kind of messy, you can use the flux of the curl which looks a little more threatening, but in some cases it might be reduced to a simple integral. Or if you want to know the flux of a curl through a surface, you can just measure the circulation on the boundary. Okay, let's go to our handout. Let me get some papers out of the way. And I'm gonna share with you my Stokes theorem handout. And I want to make this as large as possible in the recording. Let's see what we got right here. So let's read this first in English. The counterclockwise circulation of a field around the boundary C of a surface sigma, that's a lowercase Greek letter sigma, oriented by a normal N is equal to the flux of the curl through the surface sigma. Now here I am using sigma, lowercase sigma, instead of S for the surface. I'm using DS for a surface element, D capital S for a surface element. I'm using D little s for a length element. I'm using lowercase n for a normal vector. <coughs> so you have to excuse me, and I've warned you that you need to be flexible. I wrote this as was written and another book I was using at the time, and I wasn't going to rewrite it. But all these elements you're used to, let's talk about sigma, the surface, which is parameterized by a function r of u and v. And then let's talk about the normal vector to that surface sigma, partial r, partial u, cross partial r, partial v, divided by the mag of the cross product. And the ds is the mag of the cross product, dA. So these are the elements you've constructed several times. I could call a little patch of that surface D sigma or DS. I think in this drawing, I wanted to emphasize D sigma is a little patch of sigma, but I should have labeled that with a DS. Okay, we'll adjust. But now I want you to take that D sigma, that little patch and enlarge it. And we've already done this. We already know that that parallelogram that sits on top of that patch from partial R, partial U, cross partial R, partial V, that area, that parallelogram is equal to the length of the unaltered normal, the numerator of this normal. But if I cut that normal down to a unit vector, and now let's think about the curl of F itself as a field. So let's add a third vector to that parallelogram called the curl of F. And what do I create? I create a parallelopiped that's made of three vectors, partial R, partial U, cross partial R, partial V, magged out, and then dotted with the curl of F. What is that? That's the volume of that parallelopiped. So on the right-hand side of Green's theorem, what I'm 
doing is summing a great collection of tiny parallel pipeheads that are built on the surface. What's the result of that summing? So if we transfer the technique from the curl form of Green's theorem on this region to this plane, to the surface sigma on the region R in the plane, and we have a parameterization R, then by the green the curl form of Green's theorem, the double integral of the curl is the circulation around the tiny patch in the plane. But if we visualize now the curl of F dot N as the volume of this parallel pipe, this parallel pipe, this rectangular solid, then summing up those volumes is going to get us the same result as doing the little circulation on each patch and summing up the circulations. And as we did in the plane case, each patch has a circulation which is added to the circulation around the adjoining patch. And all the circulations around shared edges, that portion of circulation cancels out. And the only portion of circulation that's relevant, that's left not canceled out, is the circulation around the boundary of S. This is in three dimensions, and it's a little bit harder to visualize, but if you read this instruction and think about how you did this with Green's theorem in the plane, then you understand that this, I wanna highlight this, is the natural extension of Green's theorem circulation calculation but now not flux over a curve in the plane, but flux through a surface in space. A Green's theorem gives you a little more, or Stokes theorem gives you a little more flexibility because there could be many surfaces that share the same boundary C. So if you're doing a calculation, let me return to my paper for a second. And let me relabel this. Let's say you're in space and you're trying to do a calculation and you're trying to do a calculation about the circle and the plane of radius two centered at the origin. That's not a great picture of a circle of radius two centered at the origin. So if this is your C, do you realize that there are many surfaces that could have that circle as a boundary? You could pick the simplest possible surface, a solid disk. You could pick a surface like the upper hemisphere. the upper hemisphere has this C as a boundary. You could pick a paraboloid. I gotta move to another color right now. You could pick a paraboloid. You could pick a cone. So here's a paraboloid with that surface. Here's a cone. Whose surface is bounded by C. So you have, in general, many options for the surface. Bounded by C. And that's what could make Stokes theorem useful. See, so you say, here's my circulation integral, one dimensional integral, here's my flux of the curl, that's gotta be a mess. I've got to invent a surface. Then I've got to 
take the curl of the field. Then I've got to create the flux of the curl through that surface. But if you have a wide variety of surfaces you can choose from, maybe a smart choice of the surface would make this integral very simple. So we're going to do an example now. I want to say, be careful now, though, by the right-hand rule, once you pick a direction of that circle, you've ordinarily fixed the normal. You've automatically fixed the normal for all these surfaces. Because by the right-hand rule, as I curl my fingers, and my camera is a little bit too low, as I curl my fingers around that circle in that direction, my right hand thumb points up away from the origin on the disc, on the hemisphere, on the paraboloid, on the cone. You have to choose the N to match. the orientation of C. This is your responsibility. Now, don't worry about this because in practice, this is not a serious issue. In practice, what you're gonna do is go ahead and do the calculation and then by the normal that you construct, and by the value of the circulation, you get positive or negative, you can tell which way the field is circulating around the edge of that surface, around the boundary of that surface. So I don't want you to worry about this, but you do always have to make sure that your calculation N and the description of the value of your calculation matches or reflects the normal vector for the surface you've chosen. Okay, before, I don't wanna just hop to a break immediately, but let me pick out a simple example that we could do. And even if we don't go all the way through it, uh, we'll have a basic warm up started. So let's do an example. During the break, I want to see if I can adjust this camera a little bit better. This is section 6.7. And let's pick a fair problem out of here. Not an unreasonable one. I like this. I like 353. I like 331. Let's look at 331 and then we'll look at 353. 331 has some similarities to a problem you're doing, but it's not exactly the same. So this might be useful. So 331, let's, and then, and then we're gonna go back to 353, but that's after the break. 331 says calculate both sides of Stokes theorem for this situation. And here are both sides of Stokes' theorem. Simple closed curve C, orientable surface S. Orientable surface means it has a consistent notion of what normal is. There are non-orientable surfaces, by the way. I'll give you an example. So here in this problem, F of X, Y, and Z is, 2y minus 6c plus 3x. Three components right there. And s is the portion of the paraboloid above the xy plane. 
S is Z equals four minus X squared minus Y squared and Z is greater than or equal to zero. So we're setting up really this picture that I've done here, but we're mounting a paraboloid, an elliptic paraboloid upside down on top of the circle of radius two. So let's do some basic setup calculations. And then when we come back from the break, we'll finish them. He wants you to calculate both sides because he wants you to develop some confidence in Stokes theorem. So here we'll, not perfect example, but here we'll consider this to be a circle of radius two in the xy plane. And then let's talk about one, two, three, four. Let's talk about a parabola, paraboloid of height four. Sitting on top of the circle. And I'll try to add some depth and dimension with the shading like this. So this upside down elliptic paraboloid is S. This black curve in the plane is called C. And we want to calculate both sides and see if they match. Well, I'm gonna to have to assemble a couple of things. I'm gonna to have to name a parameterization for this and I'm gonna to have to calculate the normal vector and the curl. So for parameterization, I'm gonna take a natural parameterization built on circles. And that would be U cosine V, U sine V. And then this is my X and Y slots, four minus X squared minus Y squared. Well, X squared plus Y squared is U squared. So four minus X squared minus Y squared is four minus U squared. I can use this as a parameterization. If U, U kind of represents my radius, runs from zero to two, and V, which kind of represents my angle, runs from zero to two pi. This is not the only parameterization I could use the surface. I could parameterize more directly, and you might try that. But what happens is if you parameterize directly with rectangular coordinates, you're going to end up going to polar coordinates later anyway. OK. We're going to have a minor emergency here. Hang on. MacBook is about to go to sleep. Let me see if I can save it with another charger. I don't know if that charger really works on that one, but right now it stopped it from going to sleep and it says it's maintaining it, if not charging it. Okay, so I may have to locate a charger for my MacBook, but let's just go with this. Uh, I'm gonna do one more calculation before we take a break. So we're gonna calculate partial R, partial U and partial R, partial V, and then do the cross product. So partial R, partial U would be cosine V, sine V, and minus two U. Partial R, partial V would be minus U sine V, U cos V, and the derivative of the third side respect to Z is zero. So the cross product, partial R partial U cross partial R partial V will be block out that slot. So subtract negative two U squared, two U squared cosine V. And here, this minus this, but take the opposite of that. So that is naturally when I come down here positive, Negative, when I do the determinant, take the opposite of that. Do whatever cross product voodoo you do so well that it's positive 2u squared sine v. And I cross this out, you get u cos squared plus u sine squared with a minus sign, subtract the minus sign. So I get u cos squared plus u sine squared is u. Now notice, by the way, because u is a number between 0 and 2, 
that my Z component is always positive. So that means I have constructed naturally a outward poking normal to this surface. And then I'm gonna have to do the mag of this, right? Well, not really because NDS is partial R partial U cross partial R partial V divided by the magnitude partial R partial U. Remember the great simplification we get when we do this NDS partial R partial V. That's the N, the DS is mag partial R partial U cross partial R partial V times DA. So here I get these magnitudes to cancel. Remember, I don't have to calculate this magnitude. I do need to know the curl of F right here though. So this will be the last thing we calculate before we do a break. So curl of F, I, J, K, and partial, partial X, partial, partial Y, partial, partial Z, and the F was 2Y minus 6Z plus 3X. I hope this doesn't collapse into something too silly but let's try this out. So the first slot is going to be zero minus negative six. Second slot is three minus zero, but I have to take the opposite. That's negative three. And the third slot is zero subtract two. So if I'm reading that correctly, you can check on it during the break. It's a minus two. So this is the curl of this field. Okay, now I have pretty much everything assembled to do the right-hand side. To do this, I'm gonna have to parameterize the C, but I know how to parameterize circles, so I'm not too concerned about that. So I think this might be a good space to take a break. And then I gotta see if I even have the electricity to continue. I think we're okay. Let's come back at 9.07. Give you a chance to relax and stretch your legs. And then we will finish this calculation, just an introductory Stokes theorem calculation. And we will move on to more interesting calculation in problem 353. So I'm going to give my microphone a rest here while I get up and stretch my legs and I invite you to do the same.
before we come back from the break, I'm just trying to orient my camera a little more uh, intelligently. So don't be alarmed. If I'm playing with this a little bit. During the pandemic, there must have been a new industry of iPhone stands, grabbers, phone holders, and arms, and things like that. So, this is some kind of little folding arm I picked up at Walmart the other day for five bucks. I thought, well, there's not a great risk in that. Okay, so getting ready to go back. Okay, back to work. So what we have here, I'm not altering this problem out of the book at all. I want to do calculate both sides of Stokes theorem for a given field and a given surface, which is an upside down elliptical paraboloid, elliptic paraboloid, and the curve that forms the boundary of that cup is the circle of radius two in the xy plane. So we have a parameterization of the surface. It looks like some heavy lifting right there. You could parameterize the surface with x comma y comma four minus x squared minus y squared, or uv four minus u squared minus uv squared, that's true, but then the awkwardness would be in your description of the region, which must be that circle. So here I'm kind of admitting that I'm gonna to have to go polar in a little while anyway. So I'm kind of building the polar coordinates into the problem. Whenever you have circular symmetry in a problem, that can be a convenient way to go. So we calculated our normal vector, we notice that this normal vector is naturally upward because the z coordinate tells us, since u is always a number between zero and two, z coordinate is always positive. So even if I'm sitting at this bowl over here, I'm having a normal that slightly goes upwards, never goes downwards. If the normal is inside the bowl, they'd always be pointing downwards. So let's check out what we've got here. I think we're gonna assemble one more thing on the bottom of this paper, and then we're gonna go to calculation time. Well, let's talk about a parameterization of a circle of radius two in the plane. Now that would be, since I had to talk about three coordinates, Z coordinate zero, but I can do that simply with two cosine T two sine t and zero, and t runs from zero to two pi. And if you check the direction of this, if you check yourself, sorry, I still have a camera at a different distance from my paper. If you check the parameterization of the circle here, you see that it naturally goes that way around the circle. Now, is that clockwise or counterclockwise? Well, that depends on where you're standing. If you and I are standing above the xy plane, we perceive that as counterclockwise. But if you and I are standing below the xy plane, we perceive that as clockwise. So everything is relative to your perception. So where do you want to stand? Well, I don't want to talk like that. I want to talk with respect to this normal. So is this counterclockwise with respect to that normal? So put your thumb in the direction of the normal and your fingers will curl around the z-axis to match this direction. So I do have the orientation of the curve matching the normal by the right-hand rule. So I'm comfortable with that. Okay, so now let's do the calculations. So let's calculate. First, let's calculate. I don't know, it doesn't matter which one we do first. Let's do the circulation, f dot dr. 
So that is integral zero to two pi f evaluated on circle parameterization times the derivative of the parameterization integrated with respect to t. Just that's just what f dot dr means. Now our field was in short 2y minus 6c and 3x. And our curve is right here, 2 cos 2 sine 0. So those are the x, y, and z components of the curve. So when I insert into the integral, I get 2y, which is 4 sine t. And then I get minus 6z, which is 0, because the z component of the curve is 0. Move that up. And then I get 3x, 3 times 2 cosine t is 6 cosine t. And then I do the dr, which is minus 2 sine t, 2 cos t. I am squeezing this in a little too tight, and the derivative of zero, of course, is zero. So I did this a little too tight, excuse me, but let's proceed with the calculation. Zero to two pi. And so what I got is zero striking at convenient places. What I really have here is minus eight, only this times this counts, sine squared t dt. Now here's a beautiful chance for me to illustrate what I said to you in an email over the weekend, that you should be comfortable evaluating objects like this instantly. Because sine squared theta is one half minus one half cosine two theta. So take minus eight times that, give me a minus four plus four cosine two theta. Well, I'm talking about t's, not thetas. I was stating the identity in general here. So minus four plus four cosine two t. Now my electricity is gonna give out in my lights. So if the room goes dark, don't panic. But I shouldn't even write this. This is two full waves of cosine. That's what that frequency tells me. Two full waves of cosine in a zero to two pi interval. I don't even care what this looks like. Two full waves of cosine is gonna contribute zero in that area. And all I have to evaluate is integral zero to two pi minus four dt. Well, it's just minus four times two pi. That's minus eight pi. So here's a trick question. Did I integrate or not? I did a definite integral. I did a circulation integral, but it's like I did no integration whatsoever. So I just use the geometry property to say minus eight pi, and I use the symmetry property to say this contribution is nothing. So how hard is it to evaluate that integral? You could use a reduction formula if you wanted to, but don't be intimidated by integrals. Use the properties that you've learned. Use all your weapons to evaluate that integral effectively. Now let's talk about what the minus eight pi means before we go along. So that means that as I drive this direction around the circle, the field's actually accumulating that way, the circulation of the field actually tends to be that way. Let's see if I get the same result when I do the flux of the curl calculation. So now let's do the flux of the curl calculation. Excuse me, let me get that pen out of my way. And this is not gonna be terrible because I've already assembled the pieces, right? So what we got is the curl, where's my curl? Six minus three, minus two. <coughs> this is a great opportunity for checking the accuracy of your answer, right? If something doesn't work out, we're gonna have to resolve it because it's not Stokes theorem that's gonna be wrong. 
It's me that's going to be wrong. So this better end up to be minus 8 pi. I know what this is going to turn out to be, right? That's what I say. What's my normal? Here's my partial R, partial U, cross partial R, partial V here. That's the end of the S. So I'm going to evaluate 2U squared cosine V. Copying this, 2U squared sine V and U. Then I'll do DA with respect to U and V for the region R that describes U and V, these constant limits. Okay, now if there were X, Y's, and Z's in here, I would replace them with the X, Y, and Z components of R. But this is kind of a simple curl right here. Okay, now we evaluate and let's do zero to two pi. That'll be my DV. And then let's do zero to two. That'll be my DU. So V is playing the role of the angle and U is playing the role of the radius. And let's calculate this. It appears to be kind of messy. I got 12 U squared cos V. Then I got minus six U squared sine V. And then I got minus to you. But again, let's be smart about how we evaluate this. I know I can easily evaluate this powers of u and the cosine v and the sine v are constants. But let's imagine we've already done that. And now I have to integrate cosine v from zero to two pi. Well, I'm not going to spend any time doing that. No net contribution. Sine v from zero to two pi. I mean, you have to do this kind of statement of symmetry carefully but that makes no net contribution. So I have a feeling that what I'm gonna do is, this is not to be critical whatsoever, but I have a feeling sometimes when you look at integrals, you don't see the forest for the trees. And that is you see some long expression like this, you say, oh, grind, grind, grind. I'm gonna grind this out. I'm gonna beat this integral into submission. And you want to use all of your technical skills but your technical skills also involve the symmetries of the functions involved. So mathematics is not about doing work. Mathematics is about getting out of work. Mathematics is not always about doing crazy, crazy calculations. Sometimes we do, but mathematics is being clever to avoid laborious calculations. Well, now I just have to evaluate minus u squared. So now my integral has been reduced to zero to two pi, zero to two minus two u du dv. Of course, I integrate minus two u with respect to u as minus u squared from zero to two. And that doesn't bother me, but that'll be a constant that I integrate then from zero to two pi. When I plug in the two, I get minus four. When I plug in the zero, I get nothing. So I'm back to zero to two pi minus four dv, which again, I'm only gonna do geometrically. I'm not gonna say minus four u, fundamental theorem of calculus. No, this is just the area. Minus four times the length of the interval from zero to two pi, minus eight pi. Now they match and I'm glad they match because that means I'm doing something fair. So what does this mean about flux of the curl? It means that this curl field is actually mostly going what? Opposite the normal. So flux is negative. So that means this curl field is more flowing into this paraboloid than flowing out. And the circulation negative means that this curl field on this black circle is more going the other direction from the one I specified. But be careful, I don't call this direction counterclockwise and clockwise. I call it counterclockwise with respect to the normal. Instead of saying I'm observing from above or below. So the right hand rule. 
Okay, so we're glad these match. We're kind of happy. So we wanted to do another example right now. So Stokes theorem is kind of fun to calculate with, but that was what we're going to number this paper number five. There I did two times the work because I wanted to check that I got the same result on both sides. Now here in this example we're about to do, I want to avoid doing the calculation on one side. You see if you can tell me which side I want to avoid. And this is from 353 and 67. So here I'm gonna use Stokes theorem. 6.7, number 353. Here I'm going to use Stokes' theorem to avoid work. That's just a little pun, you know, f dot dr is work. What do you get when you combine a mathematician and a dad? Well, then you get bad math jokes. You guys may know your favorite bad dad jokes. But you haven't truly suffered until maybe you a dad who loves math, or then you have bad math dad jokes. Okay, so here's Stokes' theorem. What we want to do in this problem is evaluate this field, x, y, z. And this is not a threatening field again. Sometimes I have the feeling that he could use more interesting fields. But I'll be fair, a lot of physical fields are pretty straightforward. And c, last problem, we were described s. But now this time we're going to be described c. Triangle with vertices, blah, blah, blah oriented counterclockwise when viewed from above. So we have to draw something, but first let's write down the points. And, excuse me. Um, uh, zero comma minus two comma two. And they make this notation counterclockwise when viewed from above. So now we are gonna talk about the position of the observer. So I think a drawing is necessary. This will only be a rough sketch because it's hard to describe things in space perfectly well, but here's the point of the origin. That's easy to describe. Uh, two zero zero would be a point out here along the x-axis. That's not so bad. Zero on the x, minus two on the y, two on the z. So that'd be more like up here above the y-axis. So now I've got a triangle like this. This is my C. And I want it to be counterclockwise and viewed from above. Now, even above is a loaded word. Which one, which direction is above? But usually you find people use the word above to mean from the positive z axis. I would rather they have said counterclockwise when viewed from the positive z axis. But let's picture a little person up here looking down at this triangle. So the person is viewing it from above. And counterclockwise from viewed from above, then is going to look like this. In fact, you could even 
view the shadow cast by that triangle on the plane. And it would be kind of a shadow cast in the XY plane like that. And this goes to show you that sometimes your choice of the orientation of the axes is not always excellent or awesome. So let's try another orientation just to help you visualize drawing things. Let's say I call that the x-axis. Let's say I call that the y-axis and that the z-axis. Now this is still oriented by the right-hand rule, but now I picture the y-axis going back into the paper and the x-axis x -axis coming out of the paper. Then those three dots are where? Here, here and minus two and two on the y-axis, maybe here. Arr, you know, this is not an excellent drawing because this perspective is awkward, right? But it does help me see the shadow cast by that triangle. So here's a triangle, almost sadly, almost on edge and hard to view. If you permit me one more drawing, because I'm saying you can always say, what's better to view this object? Yeah, that's not gonna work out nicely. Let's do this kind of like hexagonal pattern, but let's say X is this way. Let's say Y is this way. Let's say Z is that way. So now X is going back into the board. So now here's the origin, here's that. And this one's not a bad view for the triangle's sake. Zero and two right here. And that is the triangle right above two on the negative Y axis. And that is the shadow cast by that triangle on the XY plane. So here's three views of the same triangle. And you pick the perspective that you feel you're more comfortable with. But you know what's always the most important thing that you're flexible. Of course, you could construct this triangle nicely in Mathematica, then you have what? Something you could just rotate all over the place. I am labeling these points for the benefit of you and anyone else who's gonna download the notes later. Okay, so what do we wanna do here? So now counterclockwise again, when viewed from above, was gonna be that way. Notice towards the origin, towards the origin. And here, it's gonna be very hard to see this because I'm viewing it on edge, but counterclockwise when viewed from above, it's gonna be that way towards the origin and that way out to the point minus two, two. So of the three drawings, I think I like this drawing the least. This drawing's okay, but the shading is hard to perceive. Here I see the shadow cast by this triangle in the plane. Okay, if that's the case, where's my S? My S is what? The surface that's bounded by this triangle. It's a little triangular pane of glass. Let's make the pane of glass green. In my notes here. So I have a little triangular piece of colored glass. At this perspective, it's hardly visible. But this colored glass will be my surface S and the curve C is the boundary of S. Now let's decide what's gonna be easier. And I don't think I can have all three things on the screen at the same time, but to calculate the circulation that's going to require me to do what? Chop C into three pieces. Let's redraw Stokes theorem right here. 
let's say someone wants me to calculate the circulation around that triangle. Well, that's gonna make me cut C into three pieces. I'm gonna do three line integrals. You know, not impossible, but it's some work. Maybe the flux of the curl is gonna be a simpler presentation. And here I could write n dot nds or dot ds notation that the book sometimes uses. And this might certainly be nicer because S is going to be a plane. What's nice about planes? They have dirt simple normals. Planes have simple normals. So I'm wondering if this calculation is going to be the easier or the less intense of the two. Now, the problem 353 says calculate the circulation. So they want me to tell them this, but I think this is going to be easier to execute. So let's go and do that. So let's assemble the pieces to execute that. Let's calculate. Integral over the surface S, curl of F dot N ds. And remember, you could write N ds also this is something the physicists tend to do more as D vector patch S, if you like. And I tend to think with, stick with the N ds. So let's talk about the curl of the field which is I, J, K, partial, partial X, partial, partial Y, partial, partial Z. And the field was not too intense. What was the field? Y, Z, X. Double checking that I copy that correctly out of the book. Very good. And now let's block out here. So I get zero minus one then block out because partial z, partial z is one. I'm subtracting now here. I get a one minus nothing, but I have to take the opposite. There's a minus one. And now I get third slot, zero minus one, which is also minus one. I'm a little bit unhappy with that normal vector. Oh, this is the curl of the field. Okay, I was thinking, am I calculating the normal of the plane? That's not the normal of the plane. No, but this is my curl of the field F. Now let's do the normal of the plane. So I could say R of U and V, and I could describe this plane, but I haven't even done an equation of the plane yet. That's kind of awkward. I need to know the equation of this plane. So what could I take for the equation of this plane? Well, I could construct a normal. I could do formula for height. But I guess I'm not going to get out of telling you the equation for this plane. So let's take the traditional, let's cross vectors to make a cross product idea. So. Here's a vector V1. And that is from 0, 0, 0 to 0, minus 2, 2, which is conveniently 0, minus 2, 2. And here's a vector V2. I'm not trying to go along the direction of C. I'm just trying to make two vectors on here. 0, 0, 0 to 2, 0, 0. This vector V2 would be conveniently two zero zero. And now the cross product, V1 cross V2. That'll give me the normal to my plane, which is zero if I block out the I slot. Four if I block out the J slot. Remember, because I'm taking the opposite of what I see, and what I see is minus four. And then here, this is also four. So that's the normal to my plane. Of course, one, one is also the normal to my plane. 
So my plane equation, the green plane equation is no x's plus four y's plus four z's. And then I just have to put any one of these points into that plane. And you could see that they all result in the same, but the simplest point to plug in is zero, zero, zero. So this is zero. And simplified, this plane would be y plus z equals zero, you know, divide by four. So now let's parameterize that. Let's formally parameterize that. I'm not gonna learn anything new, but I wanna show you that when I parameterize it, I get the same normal result that I just calculated. So parameterizing it would be, let's let x be u, let's let y be v, but z is equal to the opposite of y. So this will be minus v right here. Now, where do I want u and v to run? If u is the x component, then where is the x component of this blue triangle, the shadow cast by this? Then u is going to run from 0 to 2. And then let's think about this blue triangle. Maybe I should draw the blue triangle out on the side. It crosses the x-axis 2. It crosses the y-axis at minus 2. So it's over here. So that blue triangle is down in here. X, Y, because it's backwards on the Y axis. So for every X or for every U I pick, then I'm gonna run that Y from low to high. That Y is gonna run up to zero and along this line. Now what's this line right here? This line equation is the restriction of this to z equals zero. Well, let's say in the xy plane, this is x minus y equals two. Because if y is zero, I should get x equals two. And if x is zero, I should get y equals minus two. So if I solve that for y, y equals x minus two, if I add y to both sides, subtract two from both sides, then I'm gonna run my y's from x minus two to zero. Do a quick safety check on that. If x is zero, then you're gonna run y from minus two to zero. If x is two, you're gonna run y from zero to zero. That makes sense. So now I'm just gonna switch to u's and v's. So u minus t, v equals zero. So now I formally parameterized this triangular patch S in space. Okay, good. But notice when I do the partial R partial U, okay, with well my camera position, I'm not doing excellent on keeping things under the camera. So I apologize for that. I have to get used to this different setup. Partial R partial U is one, zero, zero. Partial R partial V is zero, one, minus one. And that cross product, partial R partial U cross partial R partial V is zero, one, one. Remember in the J slot, you do minus one minus zero, but you have to take the opposite of that to say one. And this is the same normal that I calculated right here. If I just look at y plus z equals zero up there. It could have been oppositely directed, but let's see what this says by the picture. So by the picture, I'm creating a normal that goes up and out because remember, see z coordinate positive, y coordinate positive, but z coordinate positive is sometimes easier to visualize. My normal is going out of the plane. And the way I've drawn these red arrows, excuse me, the way I've drawn these red arrows that fits the counterclockwise circulation of that curve.
So now I've got these things matching my observer from above. Okay, so now let's do the calculation. So my Stokes theorem calculation, curl, a lot of buildup, but now the calculation is going to go pretty fast because my curl was a constant, minus one, minus one, minus one, constant vector. My normal, my NDS was just zero, one, one. The A, remember when you're doing the NDS, you're not magging out because the magnitude is canceled with a DS. So now I'm gonna do this. This is DA, U and V. And now I, execute my u's and v's right here. I'm gonna say the constant limit u from zero to two on the outside, always a constant limit on the outside. And then v will go from u minus two to zero. That'll be the order dv du. But I'm gonna get very nice geometry interpretation from here. I don't think I'm hardly going to evaluate anything here. Watch this. So when I dot these two things, what do I get? I get minus two dA. I'm not even going to bother to go into the limits. That's minus two, really, RDA. And what is the area of this blue triangular patch, which we called R. What's two by two triangle? One half base times height, one half two by two, one half four is two itself. This is minus two to two. Now you could go and do this evaluation if you like, but using the geometry of the problem. And because I had a gift of a constant dot product here, didn't involve any X, Y's, or Z's that I had to substitute for my parameterization. This is minus four. Now we have to interpret that. So this says the counterclockwise circulation when viewed from above is minus four. So now we have to say what happens for this observer. This observer was setting the orientation of C counterclockwise, but it learned that the circulation was minus four. It's kind of awkward when I go back to drawings earlier, because when you're reading this, then you're asking, where is this minus four coming from? So in that sense, the video is kind of important and necessary, and I shouldn't be so casual when I make a video recording here. But the circulation being minus four means actually the net flow of this field is the other way along the curve. Now the field might flow one way or other way on any part of this curve, but the net flow is clockwise with respect to the observer. Negative circulation counterclockwise is a positive circulation clockwise. So you can stay with a negative four because they wanted you to do counterclockwise when viewed from above. But if you had to explain what negative four meant, you meant that the tendency of this field is to circulate clockwise when viewed from above according to that observer. So be really careful that you orient your curve with respect to the normal and that you interpret the value you calculate with respect to that orientation you set up. So that's actually really, really important. Uh, do I want to verify this? Excuse me, let me tear off my paper. Now this is the part where you gotta develop some experience or confidence, how would I verify it? Well, verifying it would go and set up these three line integrals. 
And those three line integrals better produce a result of minus four. In other words, can I calculate this directly? Well, the answer is yes, I can, but do I want to calculate it directly? Then I'm doing a problem. What if the C was made out of 10 lines? What if the C was made out of lines and bendy curves? You know, something that's not convenient to calculate. What if inserting the curve into the field was not convenient? Now, it turns out in this case, the curves are not hard to describe and inserting them in the field would not be hard to describe. So I have half a mind to check this out. But the normal use of Stokes theorem is to say, this is a shortcut. What we did was a shortcut for calculating the circulation. You're liable to look at all this work and say, that wasn't really a shortcut. Well, it depends on how bad that curve is. I don't think it's unreasonable to check. So why don't we quickly parameterize that curve? Let me get it handy over here. So I can refer to it on my paper and let me follow the arrows. R1, R2, and R3. And there again, I go writing on a previous drawing. But R1 starts at 200 zero, zero, and ends at 000. zero, zero. So this would do that as T ranges from 0 to 2. This starts at 200 zero, zero, and it ends at 000. zero, zero. Now I constructed that just by following that axis, but you could also think of that as a line segment. R2 of t goes from 0, 0, 0 to 0, minus 2, 2. You can do that like this. As t goes from 0 to 1. You could also do it like this. As t goes from 0 to 2. Which one do you like better? Do you want to keep the same interval for t? That's not a requirement. But I kind of visually like the same interval for t. So I'll maintain that. And then we go from here to here. That's going to be a little bit more careful. Notice the t changes, uh, the x component changes from 0 to 2. So I'll let that be represented by t. And the Y component changes from minus two to two. So minus two plus T, we'll do that. When T is zero, this is minus two. When T is two, this is zero. And then the Z component goes from two to zero. So that's two minus T. The DR1 is minus one, zero, zero. The DR2, excuse me, is zero minus one, one, and the dr3 is one, one, minus one. Now let's plug the field. Let's plug each of these curves into the field. And remember the field, was relatively simple. Oh, I got to grab this field. It was y, z, x. So when I plug R1 into that field, what I get is two minus t, zero, zero into here. The two minus t is the x. It shows up in the last slot. The y and z are zero. And the dr1 is minus one, zero, zero. Well, that's happy. That dot product is zero. So that line integral contribution is nothing. 
Now let's do plug in R2. And do dr2. And what does that give me? R2 is right here. Plug this into my field. Give me a y is a minus t. Give me a z, which is a t. And give me an x, which is a zero. And then a dr2, where's my dr2 right here, is zero minus one, one. And that gives me something. It gives me a minus t. So that I'm going to have to evaluate from 0 to 2. Evaluating this from 0 to 2 produce nothing. I evaluate this from 0 to 2. And again, I'm going to go geometry on you. That's the line minus t. That's 0 to 2. So remember, this is net area. So it's a triangle of 2 by 2. And uh, below the axis, one half two by two below the axis is minus two. That's that contribution. Sorry. It, it just is, is to be just as well to evaluate this for the fundamental theorem. But I just want to think about this pictorially. I want to think about this geometrically. The last contribution is F of R3 dot dr3. So what, which one was more work? I don't know. Uh, that gives me a y of minus 2 plus t and a z of 2 minus t and an x of t. And I want to dot this with dr3, which was 1, 1, minus 1. What is that result? Negative 2 plus t. Let's be careful with my minus signs plus 2 minus t, minus t. Now, how does that work out? Negative 2, 2. Do they cancel each other out? Yes, those two slots cancel each other out. Negative 2 plus 2 is 0. t minus t is 0. So I'm just going to evaluate again. 0 to 2 minus t dt, which we've already said is minus 2. So now I've got the whole counterclockwise circulation f dot dr equals zero plus minus two plus minus two plus minus four. And that matches the surface integral calculation I did right here. I don't know which one is easier. You can call it as you see it. The surface integral turned out to be just a constant in an area of a triangle. Of course, these three line integrals turned out to be simple one dimensional integrals that I could interpret as area of a triangle. And again, as area of a triangle or a zero in a sphere. Which one was easier? I don't think there's much uh, either way, but I attribute that to the kind of mellowness of this field and the mellowness of this curve bounding this triangular piece of a plane. Okay, so where are we going with this? I'm thinking about this. I mean, right now we're up against traditional topping, stopping time. So I think we're gonna call it a day and move over to our office hours. So, uh, you practice this, you practice both sides, but be sensitive to the day where you want to use one side as a shortcut for the other side. Sometimes this is the shortcut for the other side. Okay, you explore this. You can also explore 6 8. We'll talk about 6 8, and you can prepare to do your 6 8 homework a little bit quicker if you can, so you can concentrate on your exam, and then you'll be well on your way. So be strong. We've got two more weeks to go, and then you can take a short break. I'll talk to you guys again on Thursday. Have a good day.